So the first speaker then is Lori Lambert. Um, and she is a community research associate, um, part of the CEO um, at MSU and associate faculty at the University of Montana as well. And, and the title of her talk is Research from Our Paradigm Beyond CBPR. Thanks. So take it away. Thank you. So first of all, I want to just say thank you to the traditional owners of this land for letting us come here in this beautiful space. I'm also privileged to live on the Flathead Indian Reservation, and I so appreciate being able to live there. I was gonna say something to Gita too. But I'm gonna introduce myself in our Mi'kmaq language, because people never hear Mi'kmaq. I'm looking for James Jarvis. Did he leave? Okay. Kwai kwai matalawin, weli etzi puk. Mean de Luisi Kunick, Wedgie a Montana State University, Lentuk, Wedgie Walaliuk. So, what I said was um, Lori Lambert. My name is, she travels with an otter spirit, and I'm from the Deer Clan. And um, thank you very much, and I feel fun. So, my degree, uh, I'm a medical ecologist, but I also have a Master's in Environmental Science and a nursing degree. And I've been researching a lot in Native communities. Uh, I did research up in our own community, up in Maine, on um, mercury levels in women who are of childbearing age. We also did a study on uh, arsenic in the water. I worked a lot in Alaska. I did my PhD work up here with breast cancer survivors here and in Labrador. And I was lucky enough when I was in my doctoral program to be part of an NSF grant who, uh, which studied climate change at Tulick Lake under Skip Walker. And I probably destroyed his soil samples. So what I'm going to do in the beginning here is to give you objectives, because I've been teaching, and you can read those. We're going to look at how indigenous research focuses on the cultural aspects of research methods related to indigenous knowledge and Western science. We'll look at the role that indigenous science plays in informing Western science, and then explore the questions which we have done that a little bit about what are the roles and responsibilities of the researcher, who owns the data, what is the relationship to the community, and who controls and disseminates the data. So I am from a Mi'kmaq community. We have lobsters as our traditional food, and moose. And the old uh, Mi'kmaq wore the peaked hat, and we have adapted some of that uh, regalia as our own with ribbon shirts. And I know Alaska has a lot of moose too, but so does Maine and New England. So here's my traditional land. We belong to the Wabanaki Confederation, which is a confederation that's older than the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribal one. And it's Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, Penobscot, and Abenaki. And the people made this confederation to fight off the Iroquois. They are right across the Lake Champlain from us in Vermont. And I wanted to harass Dr. Jarvis because he's from there. <laughs> and he said, oh yeah, we're called the badass people. <laughs> All right, OK, so what is a paradigm? It's a worldview, basically, and we're just going to do a little review here. 562 tribes, federally recognized, numerous state recognized. I hope you know the difference between them. Many unrecognized indigenous groups around the globe. And everybody has different laws and customs, but a very similar worldview. So a paradigm is a worldview, and that's what we're going to be looking at. It includes everything about a culture everything, the land, how the world works, artifacts, prayers, history, clothing, an indigenous research uh, paradigm 
just dictates how a specific culture views a subject, how the worldview is accepted by that culture, concepts about that culture, what is studied, researched, the kind of questions that are asked, the exact structure and nature of the questions, and how the data results of any research are analyzed. And you've heard this before. But the indigenous paradigm name is misleading because it comes from the community who are our research partners. It could be a Yupik paradigm, a Salish paradigm, a Mi'kmaq paradigm. So indigenous paradigm is the umbrella, and then the research partners or the people in the communities have their own paradigm. So what we do is we look forward to the future, the future and what research brings us, but also reach back, reach back to the knowledge of our ancestors, reach back to our elders and what they want and remembering our ancestral knowledge. So what does indigenous mean? I'm a medical ecologist, so ecologist studies things from a place, a species of fish like a plant or a human being living in a particular place. We've done a lot of work with my husband and I with polar bears up in Churchill. And salmon are indigenous to specific streams, streams in the Northwest, but catfish aren't. And who are the indigenous people? Everybody's from a place. You're all from a place. You're from New Jersey, or you're from Montana, or Massachusetts. And it doesn't necessarily mean Indian or native, but today it's come to mean the people who have been colonized by the dominant society. And so that's the indigenous people, comes from a place. You can see my picture there on the right-hand side in the red. That's our powwow. You can see my adaptation of the peaked hood. Um, Vernon, Vernon Finley, Frank Finley in the middle. He's a, a scientist on the Flathead Reservation. And people who I was lucky enough to go to Hilo with. So uh, indigenous woman from Hawaii and some you may recognize from Alaska. So we've all talked about why research is a dirty word. I wish we had a word for it in our own language, but we don't. And you know that people came in without respect and our families and our ancestors were objects of curiosity. They weren't even invited or asked the researchers to come in. But a, a few years ago, I had a grant from American Indian College Fund and I wanted to find out from communities what they want from research. What did they want? What did they think about researchers? And these are some of the things that elders told me. Researchers are just nosy. They want to find out stuff and get rich off us. None of the data or the solutions come back to us. They take our stories, write the book, or whatever their professors want, and never give back to us, and they never tell us what they found. So we don't like researchers. But there is a changing image of research today. And there's a lot of literature from Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. Maggie Kovich is a Cree. And I'm going to give you the names of some books that you can read about indigenous research and some other things. Anyway, Maggie uh, has a book out called Indigenous Research Methodologies. Sean Wilson is a Cree from Canada working in Australia, and he has a book out, Research is Ceremony. And at the end of my talk, I'm going to tell you where you can find their presentations to the American Indigenous Research Association. Dr. Bajeli Chilisa is from Botswana, and she has been educated in Pennsylvania, and she started the Botswana Indigenous Research Association. And I was lucky enough to bring her over a couple of years ago to the um, American Indigenous Research Association conference. And Dr. Linda T. Smith, she's the first person who ever wrote a book on decolonizing methodologies. And she's going to be our guest speaker this year at the AWA conference. 
So we have some from the United States as well. A lot of people from Alaska know Dr. Quagley, Vine Deloria, Beatrice Medicine, Joe Gon, Michael Yellowbird, and Kukahaklo from, uh, from Hawaii. So this is a su succinct what it means to have indigenous research, but we're also going to talk about indigenous research methods. So it's all uh, indigenous research. If you're an indigenous researcher conducting research in an indigenous community, or if you're an indigenous researcher conducting research in a non-indigenous community or with non-indigenous people, or a non-indigenous researcher conducting research in an indigenous community. That's what we think of when we think of indigenous research. But we don't have any idea up there of what is the method of collecting the data. So there's four dimensions, and I'll let you read those. But the most important one is it targets a local phenomenon. It's place-based. So instead of using external theory from the West to identify a, a, a process, an issue, it's based on the community where that research is being done. And it can be integrative. And we call that two-eyed seeing. One eye sees it from the Western view, and one eye sees it from the indigenous view. And it's an integrative method. And a lot of um, research are using both methods. And it's locally relevant. So we've already talked a lot, and um, Vernon did a really great job of talking about why indigenous methods are important. And I was happy to see that um, Annie Belcourt talked about CBPR plus, because that's what this is all about. So you can see in the Western and indigenous scientific method, it's pretty similar, but the method of gathering the data analysis and dissemination is different. And we'll talk about that in a minute. How do you like the yellow background? Everybody's slides were white. <laughs> this is yellow. <laughs> Pops right out at you. So Western science um, versus indigenous science. Uh, Western science is more compartmentalized and indigenous science is more holistic. We see in Western science, everything is like the study of biology, physics, geography. We don't see it like that. We see it as the whole. Whether you know it or not, we've all always been researchers and scientists and discovered that beans and squash and corn grow better when planted together because corn takes out the nitrogen and the beans put it back and the beans grow up the, the beanstalk and the squash leaves cover the soil and make it not as uh, exposed to the sun. We learned that smoked buckskin is waterproof and unsmoked is not. And how did we know that? Maybe some ladies were standing around a fire one time and the buckskin got smoked and it started to rain. And then we learn by looking at animals, watching what plants they eat and what certain ailments they used the plants for. And we know all, all the acetosalicylic aspirin and the willow and the yew plant. We've talked a lot this afternoon about story and it's a way that indigenous people learn, and we're always still learning, and we're still gathering story. And this is a story of trees. This is a Ogimakwe, who's an Ojibwe. She described the lesson she learned from a group of trees. And she talks about how the older trees give protection to the younger trees. And Suzanne Simard at UBC discovered through radiation testing of carbon that the older Douglas fir trees 
do provide carbon to their saplings. And this is a picture of her and her grad student measuring carbon from old growth trees to the younger trees. And it's transferred through the mycelium of the fungi. It's an amazing process. And so that story has shown Western science that, yeah, this really happened. And then we talk about indigenous research story in medicine and pharmacology. And the raspberries and cloudberries are still used to prevent problems in pregnancy. Yesterday, uh, Vernon talked about the three R's, but I would say that there are four R's, five R's, respect, relationships, resilience, reflection, and reciprocity. And these are my two friends up in Churchill, Manitoba. So for the first part, you talk about respect for the culture, the methodology, the research topics, how the question is asked. And we always want to talk about questions of resiliency, forms of analysis, and how the data is presented. The methodology is the study of the method. People always use those terms interchangeably, but they're not. Methodology is the study of the method that's used for that specific culture or community. And it's the method, once you study the methodology and you know your community, what is the method that you use to gather the data? Is it face-to-face -face meetings, talking circles, going on a seal hunt, or a potlatch? You can gather data in a lot of different ways and just giving them a tool or something to fill out. About relationships, they come from the heart and passion of the researcher. And in your folder, there is a um, conceptual framework that we developed as part of the work that I did in the four communities. And I'm going to tell you those four communities in a minute. So the main part, the heart, of the research project is the passion of the researcher. Why do you want to do that research? The other part of the heart is you have to understand the culture of the community. And I know when Brandon and I were going up to Rocky Boy, he really did a great job of studying the history of that community, what the people went through. And then the researcher goes into the community and say, I have this idea. I have these skills, what do you think? Should I do this? And then returning to the community with data in ways people can understand it. Then you want to ask yourself, why do I want to do this research? It's really hard. Am I doing it just to get tenure? Do I just want to write a book? Why am I doing this research? And what is my role as the researcher? And I think that's very hard to answer. What is your role and how are you fulfilling that role? And does the method that I chose to gather data allow me to fulfill my role? And how am I changed? And if research doesn't change you, you're not doing it right. How many people here have been changed by their research? I'm sure, everybody. That's excellent. I'm going to um, skip over this slide because you have the heart in, in your folder, and I'm going to get back to that. But this is a way that my friend Pam uh, in the pink pants gives back the data. She works in Australia. She's the only Australian Aboriginal woman with a PhD in fine arts. And most of the people she works with are in the Northern Territory. And she gives back the data in a map, and the people can understand the map. It's important to have a resilience in your question. Instead of asking why are, what is causing children to commit suicide, a better question is what are the resilience behaviors for children who don't commit suicide? And that resilience comes back to the community. The community can see that they are strong. And most of the children who don't commit suicide have all these resilience behaviors around them. Or an environmental inquiry, why are the bees dying? 
and what are the elements in this ecosystem allow the bees to flourish. So the research path is very confusing. There's a lot of different methods of doing research. Can you find your path? <laughs> so why do we need a conceptual framework? And that's what your heart uh, spider web is. It makes visible the way we see the world, gives you a path to follow. It demonstrates how the research empowers the community, how the researcher understands the culture, and how the research helps the community from historical trauma and re this demonstrates responsible ethics. And this is the heart that we developed as part of the study that I did with four communities. Oh, you don't have the timer on. <laughs> How am I going to know when I'm done? <laughs> Put the timer on. <laughs> so um, the, the four communities are, the four communities were two in Australia, one South Sea Island community, one Maori community, Aboriginal community, Saisi Dene up in Churchill, Manitoba, and on the Flathead Indian Reservation. And there were themes that were gathered from those communities. And almost everybody said the same thing about why, what is important. And the most important thing is the passion of the researcher and the understanding of the, of the tribe or the community. And you have that, I think, in your thing. And you can see all around, these are the things that they were especially important to those people that I uh, interviewed. So if you can look at yours, I won't have to read mine. So what can be gathered as data? This is an Aboriginal man gathering rocks that were in a campsite from ancient times? And what is the method of collecting the data? And uh, we've hammered this on and on these past two days, but Sister Florentia always said to us, repetition is the mother of education, but somehow I never learned because I kept on being bad. So you can collect stories, songs, oral histories, dreams, ceremonies, and stories are the tools of, of all our research, behavioral, biological, and environmental. And it lets the participant tell their stories and their perspectives. And as Native people know, there's many different kinds of stories, creation stories, historical, stories, stories of current events, personal stories. But you need to have a relationship with the storyteller and a relationship with the story because you need to interpret the story for yourself. Is this what the story is telling me? And it may not be the same story for every listener. And is the storyteller credible? Back in the day, the elders told me when anthropologists came, they would tell them the wrong story, and the anthropologists would go off and write the book, and it was the wrong story. Who's laughing? <laughs> True story. So as far as um, collecting cultural activities, of course you need permission, but you can collect different kinds of dances, jump dances. Um, in the Congo, they have dances for everything. And there's... Um, Jingle dress dances, women's fancy shawl. How, how many have ever been to a powwow and know what the dances mean? Okay, we'll talk about that in a sec. So the jingle dress is a song for healing. And um, it's made with the uh, coins. If you've ever seen the jingle dress, I don't have a picture of it. But a grandfather, the story that I heard, a grandfather was dying and he had a dream and he told his granddaughters to make this dress and go out and dance and he got well. Another dream that predicted further events is this 
coming of the buffalo, the spotted buffalo, the cows, and the white people. And in my tribe, we're collecting tribal songs. And you heard those songs last night from the women who sang. They're getting their songs back, and it helps with the elders' self-esteem. And collecting and singing the old drum songs as well. Collecting environmental data. I'm always interested in this because the work I do is with environmental health and climate change data. And you can ask the elders stories, and it enriches your um, proposal so much to have the elders stories of before and after, the changes in animal behavior and the landscape, and whether, what are the salmon telling us about the streams or the river? What are the polar bears telling us about climate change? You can learn a lot from what the elders talk about. Another example is indigenous art, the picture of Pam in the pink pants. She was adopted out as a child. And when she came home, she found out who she was. And she started making these mud maps. And the maps are made with the mud of her home uh, stream, her home river. And she makes them. and that gave her a lot of peace and belonging. So indigenous art is good as research data as well. And you can see little kids who are in war-torn areas. They draw pictures of bombs and guns and people getting blown up. And that shows you what they're feeling. So how can indigenous knowledge inform your research problem? What epistemological indigenous knowledge have you have your participants or community written, created art, told stories, and sang, and have oral histories. And you can add this to your literature, your um, literature review. And it's really important to add that. If you're having a literature review by all non-native people, is to have the story told by so-and-so. So I'm going to tell you about the Micmac potato basket as a metaphor for your proposal. Micmacs, they gather potatoes. They still do it, but they don't do it in baskets today. They do it machine-wise. But this is a 1,000-year-old design of a Micmac basket, and it was made by my cousin. His name is Richard Sillyboy, and he lives in Maine. So what a, all the knowledge of the tribe about making that basket how to go into the forest and collect the black ash tree, what songs to sing as the tree is cut down, how to pound the tree so the growth rings separate, and stories that are told as the basket is crafted, and why is the base crafted with seven splats, seven generations. And this is the picture of the tree, picture of Richard, separating the splats and pounding the log. So the epistemology of the basket and the epistemology of your proposal, your project. And the axiology of it is not fudging your data, not stealing another basket maker's design, and protection of the culture, the data, the stories. And ontology is the reality of the vision that you want your proposal to look like, or oh, the basket is complete, and what do you want it to look like? And we talked about this, who owns the data. But it, it was really amazing. In Australia, the government owned the data, the professor owned the data, or the funder owned the data. But you know now, here in America, the tribe owns the data. And we talked about IRBs before. Um, some people want to be co-authored on the publications. That would also show what communities they came from. So some people might not want to do that, but it's always good to ask. The hardest thing about getting indigenous research methods is in the universities or in the academies. And it's too bad um, Annie's not here because this is a picture of Harvard Library. But in Montana, um, at least at U of M, MSU, 
University of Washington, Montana Tech, um, and Idaho. They are all accepting the methods of indigenous research. But I think the universities in the East, like Yale and other places, have a long way to go. I know that in Cape Britain, Cape Breton University, a woman actually wrote her dissertation in Micmac. Now that's pretty amazing. So how does CBPR fold into indigenous methods? And you can read this for yourself. There's a lot of differences. Mostly it's the passion of the researcher, the reflection that the researcher does, how he thinks about the community, how he thinks about um, doing his work. And CBR, CBPR is mostly about the community and bringing things to the community. The research proposal is written on the back of your heart uh, um, conceptual framework. It's very basic. It's what I use with undergraduates. How are they going to talk about their problem? And I want them to talk about themselves and why they want to do the research and why is it important to them. Even if you're a non-Indigenous person coming into a community, that is really a cool way to um, let me know who that person is. And this is all about that. So I have a couple of um, a couple of websites, don't put them up yet, but I'll let you know. So uh, in 2011, when I came back from Australia, they had an indigenous research association. And he thought, man, that would be so cool to have that for our own people. And I wrote a bunch of grants, and no one would fund the conference. And Emily Salloway went to Imbri, and she said, hey, we need to do this. And she got me funding for the first four years. And we have over 1,500 members in just that short time. And the people come from New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Botswana, um, Paraguay, Uruguay, India, China. And um, it's pretty amazing how, how it grew. The other thing that I did after I formed this association was write the book. And you can, it was all published in the book. It's called Research for Indigenous Survival. And at the American Indigenous Research Association, we have a special section for graduate students. Since we're not part of a tribal college anymore, we got our 501c3. And the IT guys are going to show the website for it. I checked them out yesterday. They're so good about it. So on the website, on the right-hand side, can you scroll down a little bit with it? Keep going. Keep going. OK, so under uh, the meetings, all of the presentations from past conferences are there. So if you want to know what Sean Wilson said, or Maggie Kovach, or Bajeli Chalisa, they're all there. And students really love it. People have been using it in their classrooms about indigenous m methods. Um, you can be a member for $10. We wanted to make it inexpensive for developing countries so that they could become members. And then um, there's a special section for graduate students. And that's monitored by um, Jesse Venable from Virginia. And they support one another, writing their um, dissertations. We've had a few um, graduate using indigenous methods in their PhD program, more than a few, quite a few actually. And there's a bibliography there, um, how you get to be a member, and you can see all of that. This year we were fortunate enough to um, start another project with this whole thing, and it's a journal, an online journal. You can go to the next website, and you can send your papers, and it's, they're juried, and we can publish them in the online journal. So we've really grown, we've done a lot, and I hope this little presentation was helpful, 
and I can take questions. I'm not the authority and I'm not the one who knows everything. And I just want to thank the IT people for helping me out today. I've got seven minutes left. Thanks. Thanks, Lori. Uh, questions? And if there are none, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> so we can get Lillian up here. Okay, thanks so much. Actually, I, I have one is, is so you can't go yet. Oh, you want to go back? No. Oh. You go can't go yet. Oh. Um, are, you, are you able to get some of, um, some of these researchers and those that wrote the book on research is, cere research is ceremony, are you able to get them here to give talks? Is there Absolutely. funding from that to, to do Absolutely. that? Okay. In fact, um, this year we have Linda T. Smith, and she was very hard to get. Okay. And Sean Wilson is coming back to do a w workshop on Thursday. The conference uh, symposium, education and research symposium, is October 10th to the October 11th, 10, 11, 12th, and it's at the resort in Polson. Yeah, so they can, they're coming, they're Good. doing their work, and um, I'm just so blessed. I was just so blessed to get Vajeli Chalisa because she's from Botswana. Mm -hmm. And Embry doesn't give money for international travel, but oh, I wrote I know a that. strong letter, yeah. so <laughs> they were able yeah. to bring her over. Good. She's an amazing woman. Um, well, any if there's no other questions, it looks like I did a good job. <laughs> other questions? Nope, before we're done. <laughs> they're done. Before we turn it over. <laughs> thanks, Lori. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. So hi, <laughs> um, I'm not sure whether we're the sideshow or the main event. Oh, it does move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, I just I just keep thinking about uh, the spicy. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Which one call it playing um, Sean Spicer? Um, so I'm Lillian Lynn. I'm not used to these personal pre um, introductions, so I'll probably do a lousy job. But um, I. Parents are Chinese, uh, were Chinese, and um, immigrated during the 40s to uh, New England. Um, so um, just south of the area that Lori had talked about in Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island and Massachusetts. I was raised in Massachusetts. Um, had my first experience with clinical trial um, back in 1982 when I got my master's degree, and I've been working in clinical trials ever since. Um, went to University of Washington. Okay, so I get the feeling if we had everybody back in here, said, okay, who's ever touched the University of Washington? We, you know, there's a lot of us. <laughs> Go Huskies. Um, and uh, after that, um, had a job at Emory University as a professor. Um, we talked about this a little bit. Some of us, uh, the academic thing is more for us than others. Um, I didn't like the academic thing very much. So I went to the Centers for Disease Control, decided I'd try the bureaucrat thing. I was a statistician there for 18 years. And then um, Alan, right there, my husband, um, really wanted to go back to the West in a serious way. And so um, we saw this job announcement, director of statistical consulting at Montana State University. And it's like, okay, not only is it in the West, it's actually where Alan's from, which is Montana. So we came back, um, and these NIGMS grants have been accre accreting, 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 <laughs> I guess. Um, so now we have four of them um, supporting statistical consulting at Montana State and beyond. So um, we're available. Um, there's me and Megan uh, Higgs, whom you heard about, and um, graduate students at Evan Flow. There's Aaron in University of Montana, uh, Jacques Philippe at uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, and I'm blanking on her name and I can see her face, UAA statistician. Um, so yeah, it just keeps getting bigger and better. Um, so today, along with uh, my colleague, Ross Singleton, who is still at the CDC. <laughs> not, yes? No, actually not. I'm, not. A, I'm a guest. Oh, you are a guest. Okay, so you're a guest at the CDC. Okay, so you're actually an NTHC guest at CDC. Okay, so maybe I can become a guest again sometime. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about 
alternatives to individually randomized uh, placebo-controlled trials. Um, and so very definitely going back to the, um, I don't know whether we call it the Western paradigm or what we call it, but the paradigm of um, what NIH, it's been described to me as what NIH will fund. So let's, we'll, we'll call it that for now. Um, so, okay, big green arrow, let's try it. Um, where am I pointing this at? So classical clinical trial, right, um, biopharm, in fact, actually all of Ross's, I think your, your examples are all biopharm, um, but in t as we all know, now NIH has broadened the definition um, to include all kinds of work with um, human subjects, uh, but right now we're going to talk about, I, I want to start with a definition of a classical clinical trial so we can talk about these alternatives, because otherwise alternative to what, right? So. We'll start with the, um, the thing we, a lot of us learned about in school, including me in 1982. I was working on a classical biopharmaceutical clinical trial. You randomize participants who fit some eligibility criteria to receive either active treatment or placebo. Um, in my case, it was neonatal, uh, neonates um, with a particular heart um, defect that uh, neonates often are born, um, let's see, preterm infants are often born with, um, and then we, some of them got the placebo, and some of them uh, got the active treatment that we're trying out for this condition. And then you follow up to see who gets better, and then you compare, right? Very simple, very straightforward. Consider the gold standard to produce, prove the active treatment is effective. Over the past few days, we've heard about how um, giving people placebo or nothing is um, often unacceptable and often unethical. Um, so we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so the research statement at the end of the day is going to be as compared to some comparison condition, not necessarily the uh, placebo, but some comparison condition. This new intervention delivered some point estimate, could be difference in means, could be something else, could be difference in survivorship, as we saw in one study earlier today. Um, of, and hopefully it's better, um, <laughs> of a specific illness or a health risk after a certain time period with a nice little p-value, less than 0.05. Um, if you pay me enough, I'll make you one. No, I'm teasing. Um, <laughs> in some target population, right? That's what we want to be able to say at the end of the day. That's what it should be able to say in the abstract or the conclusions or something like that. So we want to be able to get to that point. Um, so um, as I said before, uh, many communities are interested in partnering with researchers to uncover better practices to promote health, especially if the research will directly benefit um, some members of their communities. Uh, but this placebo equals get nothing idea is um, ethically unacceptable. And also there, as um, we talked about, and Lori talked about again just now, I mean, there may be something else that's going on that's working just fine, and why would you ask people to stop doing it? Um, you may not be able to randomize individuals for different reasons. Um, my feeling is that the strongest reason for not randomizing individuals is because there are some kind of intact social units out there. They may be families, they just be a mother-child dyad um, that are likely to want to adopt the same intervention. And, I will, and Roz will have some great examples of that later on. Um, I forgot to mention, actually, this is how I met Roz, is I gave this presentation as part of the um, of the series that Tim talked about earlier, um, and um, somebody interrupted me, I'm teasing now, and it was Ross Singleton saying, yes, <laughs> we, need, we can randomize other things besides, uh, besides just individual people. So how do we test an intervention? Um, there's several different alternatives to placebo-controlled trials um, that I'm going to talk about, and I'll go through each of these in turn, talk about what the design is, and talk about the pros and cons, and also about um, yeah, and talk about the pros and cons. Um, so there's the standard of care control, which you heard about earlier today, actually. Um, there was one study that we heard about where the standard of care actually, um, and then there's the, the a wait list control, where um, you tell people you'll get the intervention that we're testing out at the end of the study. Uh, there's a crossover design, and I'll go over all these in detail, just giving an overview. Uh, cluster randomized and stepped wedge designs, and those are the ones for the intact social groups. Um, and you can mix and match um, these. I won't address the merits of randomization. Um, it's a whole nother talk. Um, 
And uh, it's a fun conversation to have. Um, it usually, it's not always the case, but I usually end up convincing people why it's, might as well just randomize. Um, and I won't address early contamination, which is early adoption of a new intervention, and that's a huge problem, I think, if you have something that's not dis dispensed um, by, um, by prescription, you're gonna have um, uptake of something before um, you're ready to release your control group, so to speak. So uh, the considerations we're gonna talk about today is the nature of the comparison condition and consent, uh, randomizing, data collection, um, follow-up and retention, the length and size of the study. I mean, you guys get very small grants, so the length and size becomes really important. Uh, and data management and analysis capacity. You've heard me talk about this a while, already, so um, you know it's important to me. Um, so start with a standard of care or usual care comparison condition. Um, you offer the control group a standard intervention, um, and, and then that could be something that addresses the specific condition you're targeting with your new intervention, or it could be designed just to improve the health of the target population, and that's sometimes called an attention control. Um, it may be similar to interventions already available, or it may be something recommended by, say, a professional society, or it may be something recommended by community members. Um, I think the hot, but these are really actually pretty hard to do, these usual care conditions. Let's see what I've got here. So um, I'll let not Roz talk about this um, in the study that she worked on. And I'll let you um, hold that. The oh. <laughs> <laughs> she's afraid of it. No, actually, she doesn't have, she's, uh, she only has one so, hand. So. so one good example of a standard of care comes from Johns Hopkins uh, work on Navajo in the Navajo Apache pneumococcal efficacy study. And I want to thank Kate O'Brien, the PI for this study, for allowing me to use her, her slides. So in the Navajo and in Alaska, we had very high rates of bac serious bacterial infections, including pneumococcus, some of the highest in the country. And um, this was the, um, pneumococcus, like Hib and like many, um, other bacteria, respiratory bacteria, the vaccines for those create great herd immunity. So if you vaccinate a certain proportion of the population, then you can really eliminate um, disease in other non-vaccinated children. So that we were aware of this. So individual randomization wasn't a choice. So there was an infrastructure there also. So in this study, I'm just going to talk about standard of care. Um, in this study on the Navajo reservation, they were very interested in pneumococcal vaccine be and making sure that it worked in Navajo and Apache infants. And you can see here's the uh, study area. And next slide. So after consultation with the communities, they decided instead of using a placebo to use a meningococcal vaccine, meningococcal C vaccine, as a comparison. So the um, study vaccine was the pneumococcal vaccine, and the comparison vaccine was a meningococcal vaccine, which was actually licensed in the UK um, and already shown to prevent meningococcal infections, which are very serious but rare infections in infants. Next slide. So back to Lily. So um, how long did that take to figure out how, what, what the comparison condition was going to be? And, and back and forth with the communities and with other subject matter experts. And Kate was one of the big su subject matter experts in pneumococcus. So she had a wide range of people to discuss it with and they had an established relationship with the communities. A good friend of mine, Ray Reed, who's Navajo, was their community consultant. So months, weeks? Probably months, yeah. So it can take a while to establish the right comparison condition for um, a study. And it could be as simple, as it turns out, as a brochure referral. I think in a lot of places you'll find out that um, even doing what's considered um, typical or correct is not necessarily being done uniformly. And even just, so you may just end up Establishing that, or um, it may be something, some kind of minimal care, unless um, health worse, worsens. Um, the usual care might not actually have been eva formally evaluated in the population you're talking about, and certainly the example Roz gave, I mean, it wasn't even licensed yet in the UK, in the US. 
Um, so you might be able to talk to people about the new intervention is based on our new best ideas, but it's still unproven. And the usual care or standard, of pra standard practice is currently the community standard, or it could be this is what's recommended. Um, so, um, but, but it is something definitely to be done um, in the context of community consultation, I think. So the next example is a standard of care. Um, and this example comes from the Idea States Pediatric Clinical Trials Network. This is a new um, network out established out of the ECHO, the Environmental Influences on Child Health Outcomes. It's an Idea States network that ANTHC is part of it. Next slide. So one of the s studies that's proposed for this um, uh, pr uh, network is called I Am Healthy, and it's an intervention on obesity. And the proposal is a randomized controlled trial um, of a remotely delivered iPad mobile technology. And it's um, basically family-based um, obesity intervention using an iPad. Um, uh, and the, initially, they were going to use a newsletter as this um, as the placebo, but, these, uh, but NIH actually put pressure on using standard of care. So, so now the standard of care, the intervention involves sessions using an iPad with a behavioral and a nutritionist. And um, the emphasis on, is on three pillars of nutrition, behavior, and physical activity. And the standard of care includes usual clinic interventions, including our current wellness clinic. And I think that, so back to Lillian. <laughs> so are you getting dizzy yet? Um, <laughs> so um, the randomizing and data collection um, considerations in doing a standard of care st study is pretty much the same as doing the classical clinical trial, um, except that you do have to have that um, standard of care sort of in a box and ready to be delivered. Um, Follow-up and retention. If the control condition is designed to be similar to the intervention, then the follow-up procedures can be similar as well. Um, but the retention may be poor with a simple intervention, like for example, the newsletter. Um, you may not, people may just kind of like stop, may not even remember that they're in a study at all, and so they may not remember that they promised you that they would participate in this, um, in the, in the follow-up procedures. So other considerations. Um, one of the things we heard about today also was a study in which you remember the movies were the control condition and um, they actually did at least as well or better than the experimental condition. And so that's something to watch out for when you have a standard of care um, that actually de delivers some benefit is you may not be able to get that nice small p-value because you've actually got a pretty, you know, you, you, you got a good runner in the, in the race. So that's something to think about. Um, when you're designing your study, you may need more people um, just to get your study um, to the point where you have enough sample size. Um, and the statisticians really aren't trying to make your life difficult by saying you need more sample size. We want you to get that small p-value too. Um, the data management and analysis capacity is pretty much the same as the classical clinical trial, um, except that you will have to pay attention to who's actually retained in your control condition. Um, are they really adhering to um, the control condition? Um, the next one I talked about was the waitlist control. Some people, this is where you offer the control group first chance at the new intervention once the control group follow-up period is over. Some people say, instead of saying it that way, they say, well, we'll just, we're, it, this is actually part of um, the, inter the, the study, um, and, and so, you know, you're going to be the ones that, get, the, that get, the, get it at the end as opposed to some people get it uh, at the beginning. Um, and it's pretty much the same as a, a classical clinical trial in, every, in the sense that it is a classical clinical trial except that you're giving people first shot, as it were, at, in Roz's case, literally, um, as the <laughs> at, the new, at the new intervention. And um, in fact, I think that you actually have an example of that that comes yeah, up yeah. later on, um, which is pretty exciting. So um, just, just to give you a little foretaste. Uh, crossover design, I've not seen this used a lot. I think it's a really powerful design, which is that each participant receives both the control and the intervention. Some people get the control first and then they get crossed over, so to speak, to the intervention. And then some people get the intervention first and then they get crossed over to the control. 
Um, this is really only appropriate for interventions that have no lasting effect, but actually we have quite a few of those out there in the world. Um, one, one of the ones that I can just think of just off the top of my head, so to speak, is some kind of an <laughs> asthma control um, um, medication. You know, once, once you stop using the asthma control uh, medication, it pretty much, you know, wears off. Um, another one that was, um, I, heard, I heard about a lot from uh, colleagues was epilepsy control, seizure control medication would be the same sort of thing. Um, and the follow-up period would be the same under each condition, so each person is being asked to um, enroll for twice as long. Um, the, um, Again, the, to talking about the mix and match, the, um, the control condition is whatever you want it to be. The considerations I talked about before still apply. Um, you randomize um, the order of the intervention conditions. Um, explaining design to people can pose a challenge. You know, am I, in this, am I doing this? Am I not doing this? What, 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 you know, before I was doing it, now I'm not doing it. What do you want me to do? You know, before you were mad at me because I was doing it, now you're mad at me because I'm not doing it. You know? <laughs> so those kinds of is issues had to be well explained. Um, retention and follow-up uh, measures should be taken at the same time during each condition because as statisticians at the end, we're going to um, line everything up and say these were the one, the measurements under the con uh, control comparison condition, these are the measurements under the control condition, so we're going to want to line those up as closely as we can. Uh, retention and follow-up is going to be more challenging as the length of time is twice as long, and so that's another reason actually why we randomize the order, because um, if you have a lot of people that are kind of like dropping out toward the end, you're still going to get enough people that are um, in both conditions to have at least that first period of, um, of follow-up. Um, I said that again, they may think they're finished, <laughs> um, twice as long. Uh, but the main thing that's cool about these is that each participant serves as their own control. The minimum sample size that the statistician recommends is going to be smaller than if you were just doing people that were independent of one another. Um, but you may want to inflate the sample size a little bit, uh, goals a little bit to um, protect against that loss to follow up. Uh, data management and analysis capacity, you need to be set up for repeated measures, um, which is a little bit more complicated than just looking at everybody at the end. Um, and you need to be able to link data from the first and second period so we can take advantage of people serving as their own control. Um, and we certainly need that indicator. Not only could the participant get confused, but this analyst could get confused if you don't tell me which people are under which condition at what time. Um, so then the cluster or group randomized design um, is everybody's favorite. Um, we all like the idea of um, randomizing so intact social units. Um, these could be families or parts of families like I talked about before. Uh, they could be classrooms, that's really popular in um, some um, educational settings. Um, the other setting that's also very popular is looking at mouths. Um, <laughs> Um, you have oral, uh, an oral health um, intervention. You actually have to look at all the teeth in a given mouth or all the different um, gum lines in a different mouth as being related to each other, right? You can't consider this tooth as being separate from that tooth. They're both in my mouth. Um, they could be clinics. Um, they could be villages. Um, they could be assembled by the study team. Um, one thing that's very popular with psychologists um, is small group interventions and um, the idea is there is that you develop, derive some benefit by being in the same room with people that are struggling with similar issues. Um, so here's the example of the cluster randomization. Going back to that Navajo Apache um, trial, this was a cluster randomized trial. Because of herd immunity um, and because of the messaging that's important to um, have high uptake of vaccines, it was really impossible to randomize children within a village. So they, um, this is um, my home area. I worked in Chinle um, on the Navajo Reservation for three years in the 80s. And this is the Navajo Reservation. And next slide. Uh, um, so they, um, the it's team, I, it'll keep going. It'll, <laughs> it'll eventually come down. I think you have to just keep clicking. Oh, okay. So, so they actually randomized, it skipped over, but they actually randomized into groups of villages. Um, and so there were um, clusters um, that were grouped together and they all received one of the interventions. 
And then that gave the ability to look at two comparison groups, both the vaccinated, which are the little amoeba, and the star, the, um, the triangles, which are the, um, uh, the unvaccinated. So the vaccinated and unvaccinated in each of those groups. And then you could look at um, both the vaccinated in each group and the totals in each group, and um, the unvaccinated in each group to look at herd immunity. Next slide. So here's, so the um, overall attack rate was um, in the vaccinated, and then there's the indirect in the unvaccinated, and then the overall. Next slide. So back to where we're. So hopefully that wasn't too much information at one time, but the idea is that you could actually try to vaccinate different proportions of people in, or well, did no, you just try to do yeah. that? You didn't in do that, okay. In the community, there, some were vaccinated and some were. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So um, the special features of these studies is that the cluster um, or the, um, is now the participant um, in terms of, in, in many respects. If you think about these in terms of the cluster being the participant, they're a lot easier to think about. Um, so they are the unit of, of um, intervention and randomization. So we randomize the clusters and we intervene on the clusters. Um, is the intervention inherently cluster level, like I said, um, like a policy change or a new curriculum? Is it a household level intervention? Um, are we taking advantage of something like herd immunity? Um, and will uptake of the health behavior or decre decrease in disease risk be enhanced by requiring the cluster to participate? Um, so in Roz's example, um, we feel like that the herd immunity is going to have some effect, and so that's why we wanted to look at these clusters of people rather than just the individuals. Somebody's taking a picture. I'm so honored. I'll let you. <laughs> um, so... Um, so the thing that comes to be a lot of fun, uh, my community uh, engagement colleagues can talk about this stuff. Um, if it's inherently cluster level, how do you get the clusters to consent? This is huge. Um, I don't want to underplay it, but I also want to say this is not my area. Um, does the house, head of household or the primary caregiver consent? I mean, um, parents or caregivers can, uh, especially uh, can consent or assent for their children. Um, if it's a classroom, does the teacher or the individual principal um, give the consent? Uh, will a clinic director give consent uh, if it's clinic level intervention? Uh, will tribal council give consent? Um, these are all big questions I don't have the answer to, but these need to be worked through. Why are you shaking your head, Alan? <laughs> None, of them None of them can give consent. That, what do they give, assent? No, they have to go to the parents. They have to go to the parents. Yeah. Oh, in terms of children, yeah. So, other considerations. Um, randomizing, um, you have to tailor this to how you recruit your clusters. You may still be able to do some kind of a consent as they come into the study. I mean, this is one of the things that, you know, some of them will take longer to consent than others, but it doesn't stop you from randomizing the ones that are consenting. Um, it's best if it's performed by the study team rather than in the field. Um, fortunately, these tend to be smaller studies, so it's not as burdensome to randomize, say, 30 schools rather than several hundred students. Um, the data collection itself, actually, um, in Rouse's example, you saw that actually the data collection is going to be individual level. Um, on, the, on the participants, um, or it could be a cluster level measure representing the cluster. Um, so it could be a cluster level mean, or it could be a measure on the cluster itself, um, or it could be that each member of each cluster um, provides a response. Um, could you use, this is one of the things I love about these studies, you could use routinely collected administrative information or surveillance information, um, or you could survey the clusters and then maybe you don't need everybody in the cluster to give you information, just some um, random, and I say that um, with, with tongue in cheek somewhat, but also do the best that you can, um, subsample of your classrooms or your communities. Um, so those are all options. I particularly love the administrative information op option. It's just, it works really nicely. Um, I did one of these just by, um, at the end of the day, I think I ended up with you looking at Medicare claims data um, for, the, for, the for the outcome I was interested in. 
Um, follow up and retention, again, you need to just tailor this to the response measure. Um, and what does it mean if part of a, st a cluster withdraws? Um, you have to think really hard about that in terms of what is your intervention trying to target and does it matter if part of the cluster has withdrawn? It might, it might not. Um, the length and size of the study, this is where it really gets to be in big mess. So the cluster is a unit of randomization and intervention, like I said before. So that means the minimum sample size is dependent on the number of clusters. So maybe many, many participants. Um, you may identify and randomize all clusters at the outset, or like I said, you could recruit clusters and follow a randomization table. Um, but the main thing is that you are talking about a lot of people if you're talking about one of these studies. Uh, data management and analysis, um, I'll just say it. <laughs> just you need, you need your data scientists, you need your IT folks. Um, you need the statisticians. Yeah, this is our, our um, full employment act here. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, there's there's a lot of the literature is still moving on this stuff. It's still um, out there, depending on exactly what kind of study you're doing, um, or you could just do a t-test. Um, depends on the study. Um, the step wedge design is a special combination of the cluster randomized and crossover designs. So each cluster eventually receives the new intervention. Um, I wish I had a picture here, which I didn't do, um, but I think you're, you have a cluster, she has a picture. Um, and the intervention is initiated in phases or stepped to more clusters over time. So everybody starts out in the control, uh, con control condition and then as time goes on, um, they get randomized to the, um, to the, to the, to the, to the, to the intervention. Um, the nature of comparison and condition and consent, it's similar issues that we talked about over time. I think the huge issue here that um, is sometimes underappreciated is that this assumes the effect of the intervention does not change over calendar time because at the end we're going to combine all of those intervention effects back together. Um, and so if this took say two years to roll out, the stuff that's happening in the second year is gonna be used in the same way that the stuff that happened in the first year is gonna be used. Um, on the other hand, there's also, I think Jacques just told me, there's also some dose response uh, methods that have recently been coming into play. And so that's kind of fun too, because some of these interventions kind of take time to kind of gain traction. So you get to look at that with something like this. Um, some of the uh, clusters will have been participating for longer than others. And so you get to look at that gaining traction phenomenon. Um, let's see, randomizing. Let's see, you randomize which cluster receives the intervention next, like I said. And um, each step can be an individual cluster or you can initiate them in phases. Um, so here's the example. Um, crying baby is always um, uh, gets your attention here. It's like we're all wired that way, right? So at least we don't hear it. <laughs> so um, Aaron and I were involved in trying to introduce a stepped wedge design. Remember Aaron, and still something may come out of that, but I wanted to give an example from the same Idea States Pediatric Clinical Trials Network, and there one of the focus areas is on neonatal opioid syndrome. That's fine. And um, the, their combined efforts are to move towards an intervention trial to look at how we deliver care. Next slide. And um, so at management of, of infants with neonatal opioid withdrawal involves assessment of their severity of the withdrawal, usually using a score, and then trying to manage it non-pharmacologically, and then oftentimes having to transition to pharmacologic care. Right now, opioid replacement therapy is required in about 50% of these infants. However, there's significant variability between institutions, and the current scoring system is a problematic. So next slide. So one of the um, intervention trials that's been proposed that actually Aaron and our group are interested in is called reducing medication exposure for infants with neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome using a simplified function-based scoring and management tool. Next slide. So this is the current tool called the Finnegan um, Abstinence Scoring Tool. And three scores greater than or equal to eight get you um, pharmacologic therapy. However, there's a wide variation. And Matt Hirschfeld told me in real life, you know, he sees scores from three to 10 
on one shift, you know, with different nurses. And um, so that's problematic. And although this was initially validated, there's not, there's not good validation um, between um, institutions and there's quite inter-observer variability. So next slide. So a group from Yale and Dartmouth um, it, we're, in, we're in an initiative to improve care. And as part of that, they sort of fell into this more function-based approach, which was very intuitive, that if you were, really want to look at infants, you want to look at how to manage and help their sleeping, their eating, and their consoling. And if you're Tim Thomas, then you also have to include pooping and peeing, right? But that's not part of the tool, it's just the ESC, eating, sleeping, consoling. And to me, as a parent and a pediatri long-standing pediatrician, it's like, ah, yeah, that makes sense. Next slide. And actually, so then the initial work, they developed this tool and they were able to reduce opioid um, replacement therapy dramatically from like, you know, um, 60 to 80 percent down to 20 percent. So it's built on the premise that eating and sleeping and consoling are essential functions and that um, the, uh, the approach really focuses on educating, supporting, encouraging, and empowering families in the care of their infants. And I really like that as opposed to spending too much of nurses' time scoring, okay? So, and the, um, it uses these function-based assessments, which are pretty easy to learn. Next slide. Um, so the stepped wedge design that's actually proposed is to start with the controls, which is the current Finnegan scoring system, and then um, the 36 sites or however many are divided into four different blocks, and each, so they all start with the control, just like Lillian mentioned, and then there's a period of transition during which you get mentoring on this new tool. And then there's a treatment phase. So you can see the first group has one control phase and then a transition period and then three, four treat, wait, no, three treatment periods and, and the others have variability. And uh, um, I can let Lillian go into more detail about you know, how this works out, but this is the stepped wedge. This is a nice example of ste stepped wedge using blocks. Next slide. I, um, so the research questions are, will this function-based approach reduce the initiation of opioid replacement therapy for infants with NALS? Next slide. Okay, so back to Lillian. Yeah, so one of the things, I think somehow that slide got messed up, but the, um, those blocks actually were several clinics at a time, right? Yeah. They were like four yeah, or five, yeah. And that's what I was talking about, the, the rollout in, in, in blocks of, of clinics. Um, so other considerations, uh, data collection here is exactly the same as any other cluster randomized study, so difficult, but it's not going to be any different. Um, the unit of follow-up is interesting. Um, here because it is at the cluster or is it the individuals within the clusters? Um, one of the things that I asked Roz, which she said, well, we hadn't worked that out because we haven't done it. But um, if you are, um, if your infant is, is born during, the, um, dur during the, the control time period and then um, the, new, the, the, the new method is rolled out during the time your infant's still um, in, in under, your, under care, do they get the new or the old intervention. Um, that's, that's the kind of thing you'll have to work out when you do one of these. Um, and then there's also the crossover design. Uh, I talked about a lot of the issues with crossover designs also happen here. Um, the length and the size of the study, um, there's longer follow-up, as you can see. I mean, just to get everybody into the con intervention, it takes a little while. Um, so, and you might need more clusters, and it's not, I'm not sure about that. Again, consult a statistician, it'll depend. Uh, the data management and analysis capacity is essentially like any cluster randomized study, uh, which means it's hard, but on the other hand, that stuff is out there to, for, um, to, to work with. So um, in summary, this is my summary, and then Roz has other stuff to tell you about um, the fun stuff, about what actually happened. Um, <laughs> Uh, individually randomized placebo-controlled studies are still the easiest to implement and interpret, but they may not be practical for lots of different reasons. 
Um, alternative designs generally require a higher sample size and longer follow-up period. Um, you need to carefully consider and discuss the suitable control conditions. Um, participants may need to be amenable to a longer follow-up, waiting for the new intervention. And then cluster randomized studies are burdensome, but they deliver very strong effects. If the intervention really does work at a cluster level, wow. So now Roz is going to tell you what happened. <laughs> so I wanted to just give some follow-up on, so what happened after that Navajo Apache pneumococcal efficacy study? Because it actually came up here. So next slide. So um, the, there was benefit of the vaccine, 76% um, per protocol. Next slide. And then, um, and after the vaccine, there was rapid uptake of the new vaccine, which was Prevnar, which is used worldwide now to, and has resulted in a dramatic like 90 plus percent decrease in overall pneumococcal disease in children and a dramatic decrease in adult pneumococcal disease because of herd if effect from infants, okay? So, and in the U.S., look at this. There was, it says 100% decrease. This is on, you know, real life. There's like, it was like 90, hovering between 99 and 100% decrease in vaccine serotype disease in the U.S. because of the dramatic effect of herd immunity. And overall, there was a 67% decrease. Now, PCV7 or Prevnar was seven serotypes out of 90 serotypes of pneumococcal disease. And at the time, that was causing about 75% of disease. So this really had an impact. However, you could see there's this, you know, 25% that's not impacted at all by disease. Next slide. And in Alaska, that came to haunt us. Next slide. And this is the YK, what, something happened to this slide, but that's the YK Delta. And before vaccine, YK Delta children in Western Alaska had rates of pneumococcal disease 10 times the US um, average. Next slide. And right after, in 2001, you can see that after PCV7 or Prevnar, disease fell dramatically. However, in about four years, we started to see increases in disease. And I was getting calls from the pediatricians every week from Bethel and from um, Alaska Native Medical Center saying, Roz, we're seeing another case. What can we do? And I was like, well, it's a non-vaccine strain. There's nothing we can do. And it turns out that most of these in the brown that you can see that um, started occurring in 2004 through 2007 were in um, serotypes that were not in the, in the PCV7 vaccine, but it turned out that they were in a new vaccine that Wyeth at the time, which was taken over by Pfizer, was developing. And they were in clinical trials. Um, and so we knew that a lot of the disease that we were seeing, and th this was causing endocarditis, meningitis, babies were dying, and pediatricians get very upset when that happens. So do the families. We all um, have a lot of angst. Next time, next slide. So this is not a, this is a busy slide. So here's what we did. The a YK and uh, ANTHC physicians met with CDC epidemiologists and subject matter experts, and we decided really the only thing that we could do is try to get this vaccine as soon as possible. So the FDA got involved because they recognized there's this outlier up in YK that has tremendous amount of um, high rates of disease. And we and they, the FDA, actually put pressure on Wyeth. We didn't put pressure, the FDA did to consider including YK Delta in the clinical trial. So Wyeth agreed to sponsor a project um, to include YK in that clinical trial. So, and they submitted, the, um, and FDA approved it. The YKHC was very involved. Their, their pediatricians, their human studies committee, their board were all very involved. And they approved the project. But then Joe said, OK, now you got to go um, to the tribal gathering, and I presented this to the tribal gathering as um, in a layman's language as best as I could. And I'd been with YK I, um, in HIB prevent in haemophilus influenza meningitis. I'd worked for there for um, 
about 20 years at that time. And I presented this at a tri um, tribal gathering of um, elders, that's their big gathering. Five elders stood up and said, my son died of hid meningitis, or my nephew had hid meningitis and is deaf, or my you know, cousin had hid meningitis. I think we should do this. And they had that experience that we'd gone through before. And it was really that meeting that decided that we should go ahead and move forward. After that, we met with, um, we got approval by the IRB, by YKHC, ANTHC, and then we visited 24 villages and got approval from the tribal councils. So um, I believe firmly in locally done research, and this is part of our research team with my good friend Bessie from Tuxuk Bay, who is a health aide involved in this project. And we had a local study coordinator, research nurses, and data manager. The only problem that we had was with a research nurse that Pfizer made us hire, who was from, from Vermont, she came to YK and lasted six weeks and hated every minute of it. We were very happy to see her go. Um, <laughs> but we, we had local community members that served on the DSMB. Um, um, like half the physicians were involved as co-investigators or DSMB members or consultants. And the village um, health aides received GCP um, study training and administered study vaccine. Um, and the monitors were all over us. They were coming every month to monitor the data. And so why, uh, Pfizer was so nervous they did an audit, and they said that we passed the audit faster than they'd ever done it. So next slide. Um, and this is just a list from all the local people who were directly involved in the study, either as monitors or as um, staff. Next slide. And I went up to Bethel um, every two weeks just to give oversight, and I talked to him every day, many times a day. It was very intense. But I just wanted to say, um, give a little plug for the advantages of local research control, even in very um, highly technical research. Um, I think it improves buy-in by the communities and the organizations, and it makes the approval process more efficient. It builds local capacity, there's still a very robust a local research capacity in YKHC. I'm working with them on more studies right now. And it builds sustainability in, um, in, in really having plan for health improvement and, um, and can contribute to programs and policies. Um, and next slide. So in this case, we vaccinated children. It was a um, non-placebo controlled. We just enrolled children, um, and the uh, standard of care was getting um, the old Prevnar vaccine. Next slide. And um, right, you could see our enrollment up to 2010. The vaccine was licensed on two th in um, March 24, 2010, and uh, Pfizer agreed that we were going to. We're sort of wait list on the wait list. So as soon as it was licensed, they sent us vaccine, and we started vaccinated. We vaccinated 90% of the infants in six months. And um, next slide. YK was the first population in the world to demonstrate the effectiveness of the PCV13 vaccine in preventing pneumococcal disease in infants. Next slide. And after that, we saw a dramatic decrease in pneumococcal disease in infants that was sustained. Next slide. And I think that's it. So hopefully we've given you some things to think about. I noticed that a lot of the studies are right on this, thinking about, okay, you know, next phase is going to be some kind of a larger rollout of my intervention and thinking about, you know, how might I design a study so I have a comparison uh, comparison that I can market, so to speak, to NIH or whomever. So, question. Thank you. Anybody have comments or, or questions? Thanks for the, the great presentation. I have a question um, specifically about the uh, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome study that, that Roz spoke about. And in Montana, we are 
um, hoping to implement um, that study focused on that ESC tool. And so we're working, we've made connections with a number of hospitals, and um, some of them already know about this tool, and, and there's one in particular that um, that is very interested in implementing the tool with or without the study. And so I just wonder if you have any suggestions um, for a clinical trial in that case where um, a cluster may learn about the intervention over the course of the study and want to adopt it early. Um, any yeah, any suggestions? Yeah. Lillian brought that up, and I, I should have said this is like one of the biggest problems right now because we brought in at that opioid symposium, mm -hmm. I invited um pediatricians from each of the main hospitals in mm -hmm. alaska and that was one of the invitations was we have this new tool and basic and what's interesting in alaska um uh you notice that um evelyn Ryder and folks from alaska neonatology were there and basically what folks are saying is that we want to do all do the same thing because because we transport babies from the different outlying hospitals so they want to have the same tool so it's going to be a little problematic what i'm hoping is that maybe we can get them all to join us in the study and then we'd all transition together but i'm not sure if that's feasible so that is one of the biggest problems i think is you know you have people that i want to start now so that i'm, I'm trying to think of ways to deal with that good good point so one of the things I would say about that is that um, according to what I saw there, and it's, you know, I'm, a, I'm a quick study but not that quick, so I may have gotten this wrong, but um, it sounds like there's a period of transition in which people will have to be trained on the use yeah. of the tool. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that is a very practical reason to do the studies, these step wedge studies, is that um, you have a limited capacity to provide that training. Exactly. The training won't be available, will only be available um, you know, for whatever reason, um, there's a pragmatic reason why we can only roll it out to certain, um, certain places at certain times. And so it's like you get to be one of the first in your region or whatever it is to get this training, but you're not going to be the very first. Um, sometimes, even though as a statistician, I hope this isn't the case, sometimes you can also say, well, we're going to get better at this training over time. I mean, as a statistician, I'm like, oh, God forbid that it should be different in, <laughs> at later on. But, you know, that that is also an option to say, you know, that this will be, you know, it'll be better packaged. And, you know, these other people were just learning on them, but you're going to get the, the better version. <laughs> yeah. And actually, that's what I've been using as the carrot is that if you are in the study, then the network will provide this great mentoring for you. And a lot of us don't have the capacity to do that on our own. So I think, you know, these are pretty small hospitals. So I think that, that hopefully is the incentive, but that's exactly what I've been using. <laughs> Thanks. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So I know everybody's pretty much they're ready to eat and, or put their feet up or at least stretch or what have you. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll, be around, I'll at least be around um, through dinner. Um, I don't know what Roz's plans are. But. I, I have one more question about the about the vaccine study itself. I'm so to make if people you, not ask questions, teasing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this, this is not my job. Do you want me to maybe I'll sit down? Um, about the vaccine study, if you see the decrease go down with the with the Prevnar, uh -huh. and then the reintroduction of the PCV thirteen, mm -hmm. so I have that, that correct? Um, do you think we saw this with the rotavirus vaccine that as soon as you introduce one vaccine that prevents certain serotypes you start to see a rise in the other so it did is is the prevalence of of those serotypes that are in the prevnar vaccine is it still hanging around so and would you see this kind of yeah wax? That, that was that's been one of our concerns is that you know this was the most common serotypes at the same time and this is pneumococcus is a very difficult bacteria to work with just because there's so many serotypes but the, um, not every population saw the kind of um, reemergence that we did with non-vaccine serotypes. Um, and then after PCV13, we haven't yet seen an increase. And um, Pfizer's, I've talked to them over the years, they do have the potential of adding more serotypes. There's also work on a universal vaccine which would, which is based on a pro, a universal protein that is conserved, but that isn't far enough along. Um, and the conjugate vaccines are really, you know, you, you hear this term if you're into infant vaccination, conjugate. 
Um, and that's a real specific term that indicates a protein combined to a polysaccharide, which is absolutely essential in those kinds of bacteria for infants and young children to respond to it. So it's a very good vaccine. It has very good child response. So um, I think that, you know, as time goes on, things will develop. It's just like when MMR was initially developed, there were, you know, that was replaced by a better vaccine over time, and that's happened. But we have a very good vaccine right now. It's it, um, resulted in, I mean, so incredible changes in practice from um, when I started. When I started, I, I can give you all the stories, but the reason I, I am in research is because I was really heartbroken after taking care of a whole lot of hip meningitis and seeing children really devastated by those infections. And we don't see that anymore. It's very rare. So thank you. Yeah. Charlene, you have a mic. I have a mic. Keeper of the mic. <laughs> Thank you for sharing this. I'm going to give Jadon a little plug. He was one of the first year funded investigators for, um, for the CTRP, and his project looked um, at perceptions of clinical trials with Alaska Native and American Indian peoples um, because some of us are aware and familiar that clinical trials haven't always been well received by tribal communities and that's not with just within Alaska but in the lower 48 as well and so we held focus groups a half day forum and did interviews with our tribal leadership um, on perceptions of this and um, I think Jadon could speak a lot to it but um, we didn't meet saturation, I'll say that. The, the data was fascinating um, and very complex. And um, But some of the things, and obviously this is, I'm from the Community Engagement Outreach Corps, but one of the umbrella findings was that um, the relationship with the investigator often took precedence over the exact study methods. And so I'm, you know, I'm kind of pulling from both the last two presentations combined that that relationship and you went to that region, you said every two weeks, and that makes a really big difference for acceptability and feasibility um, with these communities who are engaging in things or being willing to um, engage in something like clinical trials. and. Anyhow, I just wanted to share that one of multiple findings and give Jadon a little plug in if you want to say anything or add to it. Um, it was just, it was kind of a combination of the last two presentations and how to, things to consider when designing um, clinical trial studies with our populations. That, that's a very important um, thing. These are not easy studies that people are not excited about getting vaccines for their children and you have to um, so <laughs> so it's a very difficult message and having um, indigenous people involved in working with you people from the community I'll give you one story so one of those 24 tribal communities actually denied didn't want to participate okay and so Joe Clayka said okay, Roz, why don't you go out and talk to him? And I was like, oh, gosh. <laughs> and, I, you know, I, I was scared. I've been around a long time, but these are hard things to, and, and they, people are welcome to, you know, make a choice. But we knew that it would impact the study if, um, and create concern if they didn't want to participate. So I went and um, met with this tribal council, and I came in the room, and there's a linoleum table, and there's five tribal council elders around the table and uh, they had my little handouts there and they looked pretty stern and then one of them turned around it was a woman and she goes oh dr singleton i didn't know that was you and it was a research assistant i had had 10 years before who was a tribal elder and she turned around and said, this is Dr. Singleton. She's been around forever. You should listen to her. And, and she, you know, she's like, she's like one of us. It, and it really made all the difference in the world. And um, it helped me to understand how critical that was. And I do it wrong a lot. But I have learned over the years what's really important. And that's really trying to work with the community and with the individuals there. Thank you. Maybe Jadon wants to 
comment further to follow up on that just because i Good i suspect that <laughs> that your experience would be useful to the rest of us and we have plenty of time you snorted <laughs> i i snorted i was laughing so hard actually um <laughs> no uh i guess you, we we held the forum here <laughs> apparently everything i do is in this tribal drum now <laughs> but um you know just people were talking about the importance of relationship and um you know the idea that you went out to uh, 24 communities and were traveling every two weeks i i don't know how you do that so it's, sometimes the feasibility of studies <laughs> is quite challenging from a travel perspective it was a wet rag at the end of it <laughs> <laughs> um but you know i guess uh we we do have some uh, approval to describe some of the findings from our study but one of the things that we found that that was kind of clinical based that was the acceptability of crossover designs um, because of they were seen as fair since you're getting both conditions um, but one of the things that we didn't talk about well we kind of talked about but not in the context of crossover designs was um, the washout period between conditions and I was wondering you know if how you characterize a washout period between um, it, when you're doing a crossover design. Um, this is very technical, I mean, but um, because the idea of withholding something, even if it's either of the two things, either of the two treatments, that idea of withholding a treatment is definitely not supported. So um, I guess I was just kind of curious how, how you do that. Well, it, and this is when sometimes, so that's, yeah. I, I do not see that as a statistical issue. I really definitely see that as, a, um, as how you talk about the study um, and the importance of the washout, um, because I agree. You know, I think people would like, okay, so now you're just going like, to put these people in this, I, don't, I wouldn't even call it suspended animation, but it's like this, this non-intervention state, right? So I don't know. <laughs> I think, it, I think it's very specific to what, we're, what you're doing. And I think that's the main thing about all of these is that I think like has been kind of talked about in, some, and in a lot of different ways, I think having something very concrete to talk about with people and say this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it um, and being, as, as Vernon said, just honest as, as you possibly can and, and not hiding in your language and not hiding in your degrees and all that. Because... Um, um, you know, I think I think one of the things I'll say about not doing a washout if it's actually two different interventions, um, if they interact um, in a way that's detrimental, that's not a good thing either. Other questions or or <laughs> we can't we can't add, I can't okay, uh, and add. I guess I just want to say we also heard about transparency and communication yeah, so yeah. that's quite clear so yep. for us it's just kind of uh, when you're being transparent in communication about an unfavorable part something that you know that is not going to be quite yeah, as favored not you be know popular. yeah yeah, yeah. Just, so just it's say, just I know this is going to be kind of icky let's but I have to go here or whatever yeah <laughs> So I was just wondering whether there are uh, analogies to sort of uh, the natural world or things that people go through that, you know, we go through pretty protracted winter here that's kind of like a, mm -hmm. you know, a washout period from uh, the <laughs> hypermanic, the, <laughs> the, the manic period of summer. And I'm not sure if, you, if those, there are opportunities to sort of explore kind of what people's real experiences with other things, uh, how, how that might apply to a washout period uh, I haven't really thought about it very well but but just maybe there are places to go from people's real experience uh, any other any other comments okay so I Thank you guys for, for doing this workshop. We really appreciate it. And I'll go ahead and say thank you to everybody else that participated in presentations today.